Hare Krishna everyone, we're continuing to read Bhagavad Gita as it is by His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai Continuing the introduction It is also explained in the Gita that impersonal Brahman is also subordinate to the complete supreme person Brahmanohi Pratishtaham Brahman is more explicitly explained in the Brahma Sutra to be like the rays of the sunshine. The impersonal Brahman is the shining rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Impersonal Brahman is incomplete realization of the Absolute Whole and so also is the conception of Paramatma. In the 15th chapter, it shall be seen that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Purushottama, is above both impersonal Brahman and the partial realization of Paramatma. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is called Satchit Ananda Vigraha. The Brahma Samhita begins in this way. Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha Anadira Dirgovinda Sarvakarana Karanam Quote Govinda, Krishna, is the cause of all causes. He is the primal cause and he is the very form of eternity, knowledge and the bliss. Unquote. Impersonal Brahman realization is the realization of his Sat, eternity, feature. Paramatma realization is the realization of Satchit, eternal knowledge. But realization of the personality of Godhead, Krishna, is realization of all the transcendental features. Sat, Chit, and Ananda, eternity, knowledge, and bliss in complete Vigraha form. People with less intelligence consider the Supreme Truth to be impersonal, but he is a transcendental person, and this is confirmed in all Vedic literatures. Nityo Nityanam Chetanas Chetananam Kathau Panishad 2.2.13 As we are all individual living beings and have our individuality, the Supreme Absolute Truth is also in the ultimate issue, a person and realization of the personality of Godhead is realization of all of the transcendental features in his complete form. The complete whole is not formless. If he is formless, or if he is less than any other thing, then he cannot be the complete whole. The complete whole must have everything within our experience and beyond our experience, otherwise it cannot be complete. The complete whole, the personality of Godhead, has immense potencies. How Krishna is acting in different potencies is also explained in Bhagavad Gita. This phenomenal world, or material world, in which we are placed is also complete in itself, because the 24 elements of which this material universe is a temporary manifestation, according to the Sankhya philosophy, 
are completely adjusted to produce complete resources which are necessary for the maintenance and subsistence of this universe. There is nothing extraneous, nor is there anything needed. This ma manifestation has its own time fixed by the energy of the Supreme Whole. And when its time is complete, these temporary manifestations will be annihilated by the complete arrangement of the complete. There is complete facility for the small complete units, namely the living entities, to realize the complete, and all sorts of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete knowledge of the complete. So, Bhagavad Gita contains the complete knowledge of Vedic wisdom. All Vedic knowledge is infallible, and Hindus accept Vedic knowledge to be complete and infallible. For example, cow dung is the stool of an animal, and according to Smriti, all or Vedic injunction, if one touches the stool of an animal, he has to take a bath to purify himself. But in the Vedic literatures, in the Vedic scriptures, cow dung is considered to be a purifying agent. One might consider this to be contradictory, but it is accepted because it is Vedic injunction. And indeed, by accepting this, one will not commit a mistake. Subsequently, it has been proven by modern science that cow dung contains all antiseptic properties. So, Vedic knowledge is complete because it is above all doubts and mistakes. And Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic knowledge. Vedic knowledge is not a question of research. Our research work is imperfect because we are researching things with, with imperfect senses. We have to accept perfect knowledge which comes down as is stated in Bhagavad Gita by the Parampara, Disciplic Succession. We have to receive knowledge from the proper source in disciplic succession, beginning with the Supreme Spiritual Master, the Lord Himself, and handed down to a succession of spiritual masters. Arjuna, the student who took lessons from Sri Krishna, accepts everything that he says without contradicting him. One is not allowed to accept one portion of Bhagavad Gita and not another. Hmm. No, we must accept Bhagavad Gita without interpretation, without deletion, and without our own whimsical participation in the matter. The Gita should be taken as the most perfect presentation of Vedic knowledge. Vedic knowledge is received from transcendental sources and the first words were spoken by the Lord Himself. The words spoken by the Lord are called Aporusheya meaning that they are different from words spoken by a person of the mundane world who is infected with four defects. A mundaner is like one, number one, is sure to commit mistakes. Two, is 
invariably illusioned. 3. Has the tendency to cheat others. And 4. Is limited by imperfect senses. With these four imperfections, one cannot deliver perfect information of all pervading knowledge. Vedic knowledge is not imparted by such defective living entities. It was imparted unto the heart of Brahma, the first created living being. And Brahma, in his turn, disseminated this knowledge to his sons and disciples, as he originally received it from the Lord. The Lord is Purnam, all perfect, and there is no possibility of his becoming subjected to the laws of material nature. One should, therefore, be intelligent enough to know that the Lord is the only proprietor of everything in the universe and that he is the original creator, the creator of Brahma. In the 11th chapter, the Lord is addressed as Prapitta Maha because Brahma is addressed as Pitamaha, the grandfather, and he is the creator of the grandfather. So no, no one should claim to be the proprietor of anything. One should accept only things set aside for him by the Lord as his quota for his maintenance. There are many examples given of how we are to utilize those things which are set aside for us by the Lord. This is also explained in Bhagavad Gita. In the beginning, Arjuna decided that he should not fight in the battle of Kurukshetra. This was his own decision. Arjuna told the Lord that it was not possible for him to enjoy the kingdom after killing his own kinsmen. This decision was based on the body, because he was thinking that the body was himself and that the body, bodily relations or expansions were his brothers, nephews, brothers-in-law, grandfathers, and so on. Therefore, he wanted to satisfy his bodily demands. Bhagavad Gita was spoken by the Lord just to change this view, and at the end Arjuna decides to fight under the directions of the Lord, when he says, Karishyeva chenam tava. Quote, I shall act according to your word. Unquote. In this world, men are not meant for quarreling like cats and dogs. Men must be intelligent to realize the importance, importance of human life and refuse to act like ordinary animals. A human being should realize the aim of his life. And this direction is given in all Vedic literatures, and the essence is given in Bhagavad Gita. Vedic literature is meant for human beings, not for animals. Animals can kill other living animals, and there is no question of sin on their part. But if a man kills an animal for the satisfaction of his uncontrolled taste, he must be responsible for breaking the laws of nature. 
In the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly explained that there are three kinds of activities according to the different modes of nature, the activities of goodness, of passion, and of ignorance. Similarly, there are three kinds of edibles also. Edibles in goodness, passion, and ignorance. All of this is clearly described and if we properly utilize the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, then our whole life will become purified and ultimately we will be able to reach the destination which is beyond this material sky. Yad gatva na nivartante tadhama paramam mama That destination is called the Sanatan sky, the eternal spiritual sky. Hmm. In this material world we find that everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. It comes into being, stays for some time, produces some byproducts, dwindles, and then vanishes. That is the law of the material world. Whether we use as an example this body, or a piece of fruit, or anything. But beyond this temporary world, there is another world. Hmm. Another world of which we have information. That world consists of another nature, which is Sanatan, eternal. The Jiva is also described as Sanatan, eternal. And the Lord is also described as Sanatan in the 11th chapter. We have an intimate relationship with the Lord. And because we are all qualitatively one, the Sanatan Dham, or the sky, the Sanatan, Supreme Personality, and the Sanatan, Living Entities, the whole purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to revive our Sanatan occupation, or Sanatan Dharma, which is the eternal occupation of the living entity. We are temporarily engaged in different activities, but all of these activities can be purified when we give up all these temporary activities and take up the activities which are prescribed by the Supreme Lord. That is called our pure life. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Lord and His Transcendental Abode are both Sanatan, as are the living entities, and the combined association of the Supreme Lord and the living entities in the Sanatan Abode is the perfection of human life. The Lord is very kind to the living entities because they are His sons. Lord Krishna declares in Bhagavad Gita Sarva Yonishu Ahambija Pradahpita quote, I am the father of all. Unquote. Of course, there are all types of living entities according to their various karmas. But here, the Lord claims that He is the Father of all of them. Hmm. Therefore, the Lord descends to reclaim all of these fallen, conditioned souls, to call them back to the Sanatan, eternal sky, so that the Sanatan living entities may regain their eternal Sanatan positions in eternal association with the Lord. 
the Lord comes himself in different incarnations or he sends his confidential servants as sons or associates his associates or acharyas to reclaim the conditioned souls therefore sanatan dharma does not refer to any sectarian process of religion it is the inter- eternal function eternal function of the eternal living entities in relationship with the eternal supreme lord sanatan dharma refers as stated previously to the eternal occupation of the living entity shripada ramanuja acharya has explained the word sanatan as that which has neither beginning nor end so when we speak of sanatan dharma we must take it for granted on the authority of shripad shankaracharya uh, krishna chaitanya i'm so sorry shripad ramanuja acharya ramanuja acharya ki jai where did shankaracharya come from <laughs> excuse me we must take it for granted on the authority of shripad Ramanuja Acharya that it has neither beginning nor end the english word religion is a little different from sanatan dharma religion conveys the idea of faith and faith may change One may have faith in a particular process he may change this faith and ad- adopt another but sanatan dharma refers to that activity which cannot be changed for instance liquidity cannot be taken from water nor can heat be taken from fire Similarly the eternal function of the eternal living entity cannot be taken from the living entity Sanatan dharma is eternally integral with the living entity When we speak of sanatan dharma therefore we must take it for granted on the authority of Shripad Ramanuja Acharya that it has neither beginning nor end that which has neither end nor beginning must not be sectarian for it cannot be limited by any boundaries those boundaries those belonging to some sectarian faith will wrongly consider that sanatan dharma is also sectarian but if we go deeply into that matter and consider consider it in the light of modern science it is possible for us to see that sanatan dharma is the business of all the people of the world nay of all the living entities of the universe non sanatan religious faith may have some beginning in the annals of human history but there is no beginning to the history of sanatan dharma because it remains eternally with the living entities in so far as the living entities are concerned the authoritative shastras state that the living entity has neither birth nor death in the gita it is stated that the living entity is never born and he never dies he is eternal and indestructible 
and he continues to live after the destruction of his temporary material body. In reference to the concept of Sanatan Dharma, we must try to understand the concept of religion from the Sanskrit root meaning of the word Dharma. Dharma refers to that which is constantly existing with a particular object. We conclude that there is heat and light along with the fire. Without heat and light, there is no meaning to the word fire. Similarly, we must consider, we must discover the essential part of the living being, that part which is his constant companion. That constant companion is his eternal quality, and that eternal quality is his eternal religion. Okay, we recorded two episodes today because we're still catching up <laughs> with all those travelings when we couldn't record because of the train or because of sickness. <laughs> so yeah, today we've read for two episodes. And tomorrow we shall continue. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, the link to this book is in the description. Check out our website, shravanamdiaries.com. And we shall see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna.